if you have access to a marina, particularly one that doesn't lock in and out, then consider yourself extremely lucky. Those of us that regularly launch from the beach have a much more difficult time of it. At the water's edge, particularly towards high water, or if there's any sort of a swell pushing in, you want to get the boat off and turn bow into the waves as soon as possible to avoid taking on water over the back. This is what can happen if you don't. It also makes good sense to warm the engine up while the trailer is being taken back to be sure it isn't going to cut out at some inappropriate moment. The problem is that it isn't always possible to stand in the water holding the boat while you do this. Sometimes conditions dictate that you must get out immediately and lie off a couple of hundred yards, then creep back in to collect your crew and money makes it back down the beach. This means no opportunity to hold the boat in the water and warm the outboard up. Warming it up out of the water at the top of the slip without a hose and ear muffs will damage the impeller blade tips which can ultimately lead to engine cooling problems at some later stage. In any case, a few short bursts before putting the boat in is hardly a suitable warm-up. But if the engine isn't suitably warmed up, it could cut out after a few yards under load, leading to all sorts of problems, particularly on a lumpy day, when, if the boat is pushed beam onto the rollers as is usually the case when the power is lost, it could get swamped, or worse still, completely rolled. If you have access to hosed water for a full warm-up, such as at a club compound close to the slip, all well and good. If you haven't, one way around this is a barrel with a hose lock connection fitted to the cap. Fill the barrel with sea water, then connect the earmuffs allowing you to give the engine a good warm-up run. And if you have a spur cap without a hole, the barrel can double up as a buoy for the Alderney ring. Coming onto a beach in a lumpy sea towards high water can also be tricky, so if you don't routinely wear a life jacket, this is the time to put one on. The secret behind minimising the risk when coming in at high water in nasty conditions is to wait for a lull in the waves. When that moment comes, run hard at the beach, but try not to overtake the crest of the wave you're riding in on and under no circumstances have a change of heart and try to turn around. If you do, you could either get swamped or rolled. As soon as the keel touches solid ground, have everybody out and get the bow of the boat turned into the waves. Further down the beach, or under more favourable conditions, unless you know you are coming in onto firm sand, have your crew climb out and walk ahead of the boat feeling for stones and soft ground that might otherwise give you problems. It's at this point that the marina users rejoin us. For safe open water motoring and for finding fish, ownership of and the ability to understand your local admiralty chart is an absolute must. Things to be aware of are anything that might dry or come close to the surface at low tide, such as rocks, reefs, wrecks and banks. Tide rips and overfalls are two further features to be aware of, particularly if the weather cuts up rough. Be aware also that wind farms and sewer pipes might be missing from some older charts and that details such as shifting banks and buoyage may well be out of date. It depends on the timing of an area's most recent survey date. So be aware that storms and construction work could well have to be considered when using some admiralty charts. So, we're out on open water with nothing else to concern ourselves with, only sea conditions. In calm conditions with no obstacles or other surprises to concern yourself with, things should quite literally be plain sailing. The problem is, as we all know, the sea doesn't always remain flat calm. When it's too rough to go afloat, that decision is made for you. It's those 50-50 days that present the problem, the kind of conditions when due to bouncing about in flying spray, filming examples to show here is nigh on impossible. The only way to learn how to handle tricky conditions is to experience them. This said, there are a few pointers which might help to make the learning process that much easier. 
the least comfortable sailing situation is motoring bow on into a lumpy sea. You, your boat and everything in it takes a severe pounding and the faster you go, the worse that pounding becomes. So lesson number one is to cut back on the throttle as and when conditions dictate. More comfortable in some ways, though less so in others, is a following sea. But it can be a roller coaster of a ride surfing down a big following swell, then wallowing in the bottom of the trough waiting for the next roller to pick the boat up and do it all over again. Sometimes when you are surfing, the boat feels like it's out of control and may show a tendency to wander to one side or the other. This tends to be more pronounced in boats with a pointed bow. The obvious answer is not to be out there in the first place when conditions are so bad as to raise concerns. But sometimes we get caught out and simply have to deal with whatever gets thrown at us on the day. When conditions do give rise for concern, try tacking across the waves rather than dealing with them coming directly at you. Taking a zigzag course cutting the waves at 45 degrees makes for a far more comfortable ride. Unfortunately, it also takes longer and uses up far more fuel, as does motoring at low speed, and the last thing you need is for the fuel tank to run dry, making a bad situation even worse. So it's important always to carry extra fuel. There are some things you can do to minimise the risk of getting caught out. One is to check the weather with the Coast Guard before setting off. Another is to take note of the direction of the wind and the tide for your fishing period and try to time things so that both are pushing in the same direction. Wind and tide working in opposing directions will make sea conditions worse. Alternatively, on an iffy forecast, try to choose a mark that puts the wind and the waves on your stern when returning back to base in case things do deteriorate. There are also little extras that you can add to your boat that will make your time on the water both safer and more comfortable, such as fitting grab rails to the cuddy lip to hold on to in rough conditions. Grab rails fitted to the stern to pull yourself into the boat are also useful. Climbing aboard wearing waders and bulky clothing can be difficult even in flat conditions, never mind when launching in a swell. A transom step or a short ladder can also help. The ladder in particular is somebody ends up slipping overboard. And finally, trim tabs. Without going into all the technicalities of how these things work, suffice to say, they will stabilise a boat laterally when under power, help bring the nose up to the correct position to prevent porpoising, and bring extra fuel economy. Whether you fish at anchor or on the drift, it's vital in the event of an engine failure to be able to put the handbrake on till the rescue services arrive. Maintaining a fixed position so that those who come looking for you can find you should be reason enough. Stopping yourself drifting into danger such as onto a drying reef, into steep cliffs or through a tide rip is equally important. Boats don't have handbrakes. The next best thing is one of these and every boat should carry at least one situation suited fully rigged anchor with enough rope to make bottom in the area being fished. So what exactly is a fully rigged anchor? Pattern choice is a matter for you and to some extent will be governed by the nature of the seabed in your area. But whatever the choice, it should come with at least 4-5 to five metres of heavy duty galvanised chain to encourage it to lie in the best biting position once the anchor rope starts to tighten. Attaching the rope to the chain should be straightforward enough. Just be satisfied that the knot won't unfasten itself. But attaching the chain to the anchor is a different matter. To be in with the best chance of recovering an anchor that has become fast, attach the chain to the hole at the base as shown here. You can even connect to the base of a traditional fisherman anchor without a hole by using a shackle and cable ties. The chain is then laid along the main leg of the anchor and finally fixed in place at the top hole using cable ties. The thinking behind this is that should the anchor ever become stuck, pressure on the cable ties will break them 
allowing it to be pulled backwards free of the snag. Anchors come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Anchor size is something you can talk over with a chandler. He should be able to match the pattern and the weight to your particular situation and boat. My preference is for the traditional fisherman pattern shown here. I haven't found a situation yet that one of these things couldn't handle, but other people might wish to take issue with me on that one. This is a Danforth anchor, good at biting into soft ground. The Bruce is another excellent soft ground anchor. The plough anchor does a similar job. This one is a heavy duty four prong grapnel, which like the fisherman pattern, is good over a variety of substrates. There are other types of grapnel, specifically made with large bendable prongs that can be ripped free when anchoring wrecks or heavy ground. One anchor I would go out of my way to avoid is this one. Having had some nasty experiences with this pattern, I personally wouldn't even carry one as a spur. The angle of the rope as it tightens is very important. Too short a rope creating a steep angle can lead to anchor jumping, particularly in a lumpy sea. So how long should an anchor rope be? Obviously, that depends on water depth. A correctly rigged anchor, in good sea conditions, should hold with a rope length of three times the depth being fished. But in swelly conditions, and with a fierce tide, it may take four or five times the depth to get a reliable hold. A boat should always be anchored from its bow. This does not, however, mean walking round the side of the cuddy to get there, which is downright dangerous. A popular alternative is anchoring through a hatch, though for a number of reasons I personally don't do this. Water dripping from the rope wetting everything up front is one. Taking away through the hatch in rough conditions is another. A far better option in my opinion is side anchoring. This involves the use of a lazy line which is a piece of rope fixed to the bow of the boat with sufficient length to reach around the cuddy into the fishing well. Ours is attached to the winching eye on the bow. On the other end is an attachment clip which fastens into a loop tied in the anchor rope. I've also added a small float in case it ever gets dropped in the water. This makes retrieving it safer and easier. Using it as a painter to hold the boat when launching is another good reason to attach a line to the bow. When the appropriate length of anchor rope has been paired out, tie a loop and attach the lazy line to it. But be sure you have several yards of anchor rope spur beyond the loop so that when the lazy line and anchor are running out from the bow there is sufficient left in the boat to retrieve it with later. As the boat then drifts down tide, the lazy line is pulled around to the front, bringing it to a halt in the normal way. When the anchor takes hold and the rope is running out straight from the bow, wrap the bit left inside the boat around something to prevent the tide sneaking it over the side. When it's time to get the anchor back in, simply draw the rope with the attached lazy line back into the boat. The problem is, that hauling from a static boat can be hard work because it leaves you pulling beam onto the tide and the swell. It helps then if your fishing partner motors the boat slowly forward allowing you to take in the slack without overtaking the rope. You will need to give him instructions on speed and direction to keep the rope from going under the boat. Right, turn it that way a bit Charlie. An even easier method is an Alderney ring a technique that seems to frighten a lot of people off, though I don't see why it should. There are several different ways of creating this setup. Ours is simple. A stainless steel ring with a float attached threaded onto the anchor rope. You don't even need to buy a float. A good strong barrel will do the job. We've had this one on board for several years now without any problems. But if you do buy one, then a 60 inch polyform buoy with around 30 kilograms of buoyancy is best suited to boats in the trail category. Rope quality is also important. Three stranded nylon rope reputedly offers the best recovery properties. It also coils well for ease of use. Alderney ring anchoring is done in exactly the same way as with the lazy line, 
the difference being that there is now a buoy attached to a ring sliding down the main anchor rope. When it's time to get the anchor up, the boat is mortared up tight taking the strain of the rope while being careful to keep the rope angled slightly away from the boat and the propeller. The power should be turned up sufficiently for the buoyancy of the buoy to pull the anchor up to the surface. When the buoy starts ploughing behind the boat, you know the anchor is hanging directly beneath it. Plough and Bruce anchors go partially through the ring and are held there by the weight of the chain. A fisherman anchor unfortunately can't do that. So you need to keep plenty of tension on the rope and haul quickly to prevent the anchor from slipping back down. Alternatively use plenty of chain, the weight of which once it's passed through the loop should hold even a fisherman anchor in place. One final point is that you should never attempt to pull an anchor that is snagged from a stern cleat like this. If it stays stuck, it could on a swelly day dip the stern of the boat sufficiently low in the water for it to be swamped. Far safer then to pull it from the bow. That way, if it stays stuck, it just pulls the front end of the boat around. <laughs>